All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, so my topic today is about uh, South Carolinians who served in the Royal Flying Corps and the RAF during the Great War. Um, the four pilots I'm going to profile today are as follows. Irvin Shaw from Sumter, South Carolina. John O'Donaldson from Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, Elliot White Springs from the Fort Mills, Lancaster, uh, South Carolina region. And lastly, Bonham Bostick from Ridgeland, South Carolina. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the state of South Carolina, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to come visit our, my beautiful home state, um, this is where those four gentlemen were from, or generally were from. There's a little bit of explanation with one of them, and I can go into that. Um, but uh, what I felt was really important first to do is kind of set the scene. Um, what is South Carolina like? Um, before 1917, before the U.S. enters World War I. Um, so obviously, when you think of the South and you think of South Carolina, quite often you go to Fort Sumter, the Civil War, um, you know, the devastation of Sherman's march through South Carolina, a lot of things that you can kind of go to prior to this time. Um, but what I say is, uh, you know, this is a story of the New South by the time that World War I rolls around. Um, South Carolina has rapidly industrialized after the Civil War with railroads, uh, with cotton mills. Um, obviously, that has its own issues. Uh, it, one of these photos here is actually from the Springs Mill in Lancaster of child labor. So uh, some of the reforms for child labor and unionization of cotton mills uh, centers around this story to an extent. But um, it's also new colleges, uh, education opportunities for a select group of people. Obviously, this is not a time when African Americans or women are getting these opportunities, but there are more opportunities for men from South Carolina to go off to colleges up north to learn about civil engineering, electrical engineering, and so on. Uh, the electric lights are a good, good indication of that. Um, and again, you know, the modern technology isn't lost on the south, so again, automobiles, aviation are starting to come into play. Um, but to a lesser extent, and I'll speak to that right now. Um, so again, first flight took place in North Carolina, um, and the Army Signal Corps established a flight school uh, in Augusta, Georgia, just across the Savannah River uh, around 1913. Um, that being said, I still haven't figured out where the first flight occurred in South Carolina of anybody. Um, no newspaper articles I can find. Um, still working that angle. We'll see if I can track down anybody who actually built a plane and flew it prior to World War I. Um, but I thought this uh, quote here um, from aviation was quite interesting in 1917. Uh, this is the governor of South Carolina speaking. The importance of an effective aviation army cannot be overestimated. Uh, the outlook is this, this army will be a very important factor in bringing this war to victorious conclusion. South Carolina wishes you Godspeed in making it up. Um, obviously, this is, you know, very telling. This is a new concept of war, even though it wasn't new in Europe, of course. Um, but given the fact that really most men had never even seen an airplane at this point, the best they had done is maybe read some articles about who was flying in Europe or who was flying elsewhere. So, uh, South Carolinians were back in service of the crown. Obviously, South Carolina was established as a colony of uh, England in 1670, uh, had been relatively involved in the American Revolution of kicking England out of the state, um, but it's kind of telling that, you know, come 1917, uh, quite a few South Carolinians end up serving with, uh, with Great Britain. Um, so I know of at least these four uh, South Carolinians who served in the Royal Flying Corps. There are probably others. Um, quite a few appear to have gone to Canada. Um, or of the ones that I'm unsure about, several appear to have gone to Canada and maybe received training, but may not have served operationally. Um, but I'm at least going to talk about these four who I can definitely tie to individual units and uh, with a very interesting stories for each of them. Um, so again, just to clarify, most of you already know this, but again, uh, the reason that my presentation says RAF versus RFC is only based off of the fact that uh, the change did occur on April 1st, 1918. Um, these men, obviously, in some cases, still were referring it to it as the RFC in their letters, even if it was post-April 1st. They were accustomed to that. Um, but nonetheless, just so that we know, uh, and just so it's clear. Um, but 
Another interesting fact is that the South Carolina National Guard actually also ended up serving with the British Army during World War I. Um, and if you ever get an opportunity, uh, Borrowed Soldiers uh, is a really great book about that. Um, but the 118th Infantry became part of the 2nd British Army uh, and actually were serving in ground actions below the men from South Carolina flying with the RAF, um, which is quite interesting. So, first pilot is Lieutenant Irvin David Shaw. So he was born in Alcoa, South Carolina, but he grew up in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, this is him at age 11, I believe, driving his family car. He was extremely gifted mechanically. Um, he was a very athletic young man, um, talented football player on the Sumter High School football team, and uh, he also built race cars with his grandfather, which is a very interesting thing to think of. Uh, you know, before World War I. Um, he earned the nickname Molly, because he liked to say hot tamale whenever he got excited. Um, so you see, as you go through the records, uh, even friends in Europe referring to him as Molly, not as Urban. Um, so again, very common that people knew of him as Molly in no other way. Um, but he first attended university at University of Georgia, but didn't last there long, and then transferred to Davidson College in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he also played football. Class of 1915, uh, I believe. Um, and so he was one of the first aviators who joined up, um, and so he was sent to Columbus, Ohio for training, uh, and then went to England. Uh, to be trained alongside uh, the men from Princeton and other units that were kind of being formed early on. Um, so he trained alongside a uh, fellow South Carolina Aviator, Ella White Springs, who I'll talk about at Oxford. And uh, I like this little quote. Uh, Springs stated that Shaw was a fine fellow in a note uh, to his father about him. Uh, not much else to say other than that, but uh, most people seem to speak very highly of Irvin Shaw. Uh, he was a very religious person. Uh, a friend talked in an obituary about how the fact that he uh, was very kind, would go out of his way to help anybody, and uh, prayed every night uh, before bed. So just that was very uh, telling. But so he was, after he did some gunnery training in Scotland, he was posted as a pilot to number 48 squadron RFC, along with two other Americans. So with... Uh, 48 Squadron, they were operating the Bristol F-2B, which obviously we're going to learn a lot more about uh, in the next few presentations. Um, but this quote was very telling about the kind of pilot he was, um, type of person he was. Um, so when he was ordered to go back uh, of the lines 15 miles on a dangerous reconnaissance, uh, he went back 18 or 20 to bring in better and more accurate reports. Uh, when he met Huns, though the odds were greatly against him, he fought them. Um, very aggressive pilot, uh, definitely put himself out on the line, it seems, uh, to do these things. Uh, so they were operating their Bristol fighters primarily in a uh, fast reconnaissance role. Uh, and when you search the Imperial War Museum for images of the 48th, you get a lot of aerial photography that they were taking um, during this time. Um, thanks to the aerodrome, and uh, also I should bring up that Russell Smith, uh, who did a lot of the wonderful artwork in this presentation, uh, he's actually found out that he's a distant cousin to Urban Shaw. And so uh, he just recently posted the aerodrome seeking some information. Unfortunately, some people came out of the woodwork and were able to help him out. Um, and one of the things they were able to clear up is uh, I had only run across that he had had two kills during his time. Um, but Somebody in the aerodrome was able to find the records and state that uh, on June 10th he shot down or contributed to the shooting down of the uh, Albatross 5, and then on July 2nd, uh, false um, fighter. So, on July 9th, 1918, um, he and his observer, Sergeant Thomas Walter Smith, uh, left on a solo reconnaissance mission um, that evening. Um, over the Somme battlefield. Um, they were above Corcel or that general area, um, and they never returned. Um, reports started to come in, but the initial hope was that he had been shot down and maybe captured. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. So uh, observers on the ground witnessed that he and his observer had been jumped by three enemy false fighters or false scouts. 
And then in the ensuing melee, um, he probably did shoot down one of the faults or maybe damaged it, but his plane was hit in some form or had uh, some kind of structural failure. Uh, it disintegrated in midair uh, and they fell to their deaths. Um, so the other thing that the aerodrome was able to clear up possibly is that it was, uh, the kill was credited to Otto uh, Connect. sorry, French is my native, or French is my second language, German is not mine, of Yasta 5. So uh, this past summer, I've had the fortune of going to France, uh, and one thing that nearly brought me to blows with my father was trying to get to uh, where he's buried. Uh, he's located in a Regina Trench Cemetery. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Somme battlefield, but what I can tell you is um, much of it is farm roads, and I highly recommend the 4x4 um, because uh, we started on asphalt and uh, progressed to rutted country road to... Uh, basically go path. Um, and uh, long and short, I made it very clear I was going to get there one way or the other, even if I had to walk a half mile. Uh, we made it work. Uh, if you're going there, though, definitely come from the Corsell side. Um, but he's the only American buried in the cemetery. Um, uh, so these two remembrances were pretty telling. Um, so he's one of the bravest and coolest lads, always cheery and stout-hearted, no matter what work was wanted. Um, that was a uh, major part of the 48th Squadron, and we wrote that to his mother. Um, and then uh, Brian Beatty, who you saw the other Puri's quote one of, he was the only surviving American left of the three that had been posted to 48th Squadron by the time that Molly was killed. Uh, and he said, Molly was my best friend out here, and though I had known him but a little while, I was proud of the knowing. Um, then... Going back to Elliot White Springs, he actually mails his father and says, Hey, Dad, it, you know, please write to Shaw's kin. And so his father, Leroy Springs, the millionaire uh, cotton mill owner, uh, wrote to Irvin Shaw's mom. And unfortunately, some of the letter becomes more of a, Hey, let me talk about my son, even though your son just was killed. But this section was very, very nice and I felt was worth including. So my son wishes to say to you, that your son was a prince among men, a game fighter, a man of heroic death in defense of his country, and was highly esteemed by each and every member of the Corps, speaking to the Corps, the Italian uh, Corps that was, they were thinking they were going to Italy to train to fly in Italy. Um, but he was 23 years old, even though the tombstone says 24, he hadn't quite reached 24 years old. Um, and he's buried alongside his observer, because when we see the two tombstones like that, that means that there was no way to identify which was which. So, next up we have Captain John Owen Donaldson. Um, <laughs> notice, it says he was born in Fort Yates, North Dakota. I have an explanation. So despite being born in North Dakota, he was an army brat. Um, his father, uh, General Thomas Quentin Donaldson, was a West Point graduate, uh, and had, his first posting actually was at the uh, massacre um, in, uh, sorry, my brain just left me, it'll come back to me, Wounded Knee, thank you. So he was a young lieutenant at Wounded Knee, uh, served all throughout the West, um, but by the time World War I rolls around, he's actually the Inspector General of the Services Supply Tour. Um, so... <coughs> John had kind of lived all over the place um, during that time. However, his connection to Greenville, South Carolina was extremely strong. Most of his extended family, his grandparents lived in Greenville or in my hometown of Greenwood. Um, and so he actually grew up, spent many summers there, and actually also attended Greenville High School and graduated from there and spent his freshman year at Furman University, uh, my alma mater. Um, after his freshman year, he transferred to Cornell University uh, as a civil engineering student. Um, but one thing that's been very fortunate to me is he kept up a correspondence with several of his relatives in Greenville, and one of them was related to the Furmans, who Furman University is named after. And fortunately, Furman University's Special Collections has several letters that he sent home that are quite interesting. Um, so this one came in on May 14, 1918. Uh, Dear Aunt Nan, there's not much to tell you that I haven't told you in the last letter, except that I have been attached to a squadron, and I'm now working quite hard. The machines in the States are nothing compared to those we have here. The ones I was flying today is three times as fast as those that I flew in the state. The main thing I have to practice here is shooting machine guns while in the air. Although I did this in the States, it was comparatively simple to do as the machines were so slow. 
Um, he's in love with Speed. It's apparent through several of his letters. As soon as he's sitting inside a real fighter versus a Jenny or an Avro, he's a much, much happier person. Um, he goes on in another letter, and this one was from Castle Bromwich. Uh, this other one's quite uh, interesting, too. So he uh, is in Saltburn, England, which is in Yorkshire. It's very cold there. Uh, he talks about how bad the food is in another section of this and just how much he wants to get to the front. He's tired of being at this, uh, this uh, waiting pool to go to France. Um, but he talks, and this is quite interesting, that he was fortunate to be on the list in such a way that because he was 306 and not uh, 300, uh, he was not sent to be a bomber pilot or an observer. Um, that he was lucky to squeak in as one of the first scout fighter aviators. Um, so, again, he, uh, he got lucky. So he's posted to number 32 Squadron RFC. Um, he flew the SE-5A uh, with number 32 uh, and used it to great effect. He was quite a good pilot with it. Um, so... One thing I've learned, and I'm sure all of you have encountered this, it's very hard to clear up how many kills somebody actually had between who's confirming and who's not confirming. And is it, you know, the British versus the AEF? And, you know, is it... Um, so the long and short of it is, uh, I would say he probably had seven to eight victories. There's even things I've read that he shot down a balloon. I've found no record of that. Um, so, again, but he did this all in two months, which is pretty impressive, given, given the short time he was there. Um, so, because of his efforts, uh, eventually he's awarded uh, the DSC, but the two awards he's awarded during the war are the British Distinguished Flying Cross, because the American Distinguished Flying Cross it doesn't come out until the 20s, and the Belgian Croix de Guerre, and there's, an ex there's a reason for that one, and I'll give you that momentarily. So, uh, a few more images of 32 squadrons, uh, SE-5s, again, the two kind of A-shaped diagonal white lines give you the tell that is 32 squadron, he was in B-flight. Um, this is a remark that, uh, that Russell Smith was very kind uh, to do for me in a copy of his book of Donaldson's uh, SE-5. So, I'm not going to have him read all this, but... Um, the moral of the story, this is uh, from his Distinguished Flying Cross citation. Um, over and over and over again through this citation, it talks about how aggressive he was, how he would just throw his aircraft into a mix of other uh, German fighters. Again, by this point of the war, it seems that all he can find are Fokkers. Uh, Fokker D7s everywhere. Uh, it just seems to be the case. Um, but, it, you know, he is just a very aggressive pilot. Um, you know, constantly going into close range. He's doing all the things that you imagine a fighter fighter pilot should um, to be effective in what they do. Um, so uh, this is a painting that was done out of one of the Osprey series, uh, one of those engagements uh, during the Kaiserschlacht or just after the, the 100 days. Again, can't speak to the authenticity. However, I can say that in one of the reports he talks about seeing blue and white painted Fokker D7s. Um, so whether or not this is true or not, I don't know, but it's still an interesting image, and it kind of gives you some of the, uh, the thrill or maybe the, the utter terror, I don't know, somewhere in between those two that had to have been experienced by these guys uh, in the air. So luck runs out for him, unfortunately, on September 1st, 1918. Um, they are leading a bomber squadron on a mission towards uh, Solmé, uh, uh, France. Um, his fuel pump, uh, it says engineer pump in the, uh, his story, however I'm taking it as a fuel pump, dies. Um, so he's there hand pumping, trying to keep the engine running. Uh, eventually he realized, oh, I have a gravity tank. But by the time that he's descended from altitude, uh, he's only down to around 9,000 feet. He's been separated from the rest of his squadron. Um, he's all alone. And he sees the Allied lines. He sees the front lines. But unfortunately, between him and the front lines are three Fokker D7s uh, with just little old him all by himself. Um, not a good scenario. He still, in usual John Donaldson fashion, it seems, goes into the fight and 
is dogfighting with them best he can. He talks about how you know he's nearly on one when the other two get on his tail, so he's having to peel off and try to go after another. Eventually, he's able to shoot down one, at least by his approximation. Um, and, well, definitely shoots it down, and I have not been able to confirm it from the German side. Um, but the other two were able to get enough rounds into him that they disabled his engine, uh, took out the cylinders on the left side, I believe is what he said. Uh, long and short, he glides down um, to and to the German lines, or behind the German lines. Uh, he does say he had enough time to actually try to disable his aircraft and destroy some of the important things. Uh, he also notices he lands very close to the German Fokker that he had hit and that had caught on fire. Um, he tried to pull the German pilot out, um, but the German pilot, as he said, was burned black, so there wasn't anything he could do for him. Uh, fortunately for him, the German uh, infantrymen who came up on him noticed he was trying to offer aid to this German pilot and were much friendlier than he imagined they would have been otherwise towards him. They did say, interestingly, in his account that they checked to make sure he didn't have exploding bullets. Um, they fired his guns to be sure that that wasn't the case, because he said if they had found the exploding bullets, they would have just shot him outright. So, this is where it gets really interesting, and don't think that The Great Escape uh, you know, uh, movie got it first. Uh, John Donaldson had one heck of a Great Escape. He actually had two Great Escapes. Um, so he's captured, initially taking uh, to Balancen, uh, where he escapes with this guy right here, Lieutenant Oscar Man uh, Mandel. Spelling seems to be Mandel with one L or two Ls. He was a pilot with the 148 Squadron, who was connected back to LA White Springs. Are we seeing how circuitous and connected everything is? It always seems this way to me. Um, so Mandel spoke German. Um, and he was able to constantly convince these German sentries at night that they were just German officers drunk or whatever else, leave us alone, and was able to do it well enough that uh, he, they, they were left alone or that they were German aviators. So one night they finally get to La Centenelle, and they find a German airfield there. Um, the Germans had been wary of sleeping on their airfield, so apparently they had slit trenches off to the side because of Allied bombing at night. <coughs> Um, so there was nobody at the airfield, so they were rolling in, I think, around 2 or 3 in the morning. Um, and they find the airfield unguarded, they find a hangar, one of these canvas pop-up hangars, and inside it, uh, as he said, dovetailed into the two corners are uh, two-seater albatrosses. I took a guess, being late war, that that probably would be what it is. Um, the albatross, is that the C-7? Yes? No, maybe? Um, anyway, albatross two-seater is what he said. Um, Donaldson was confident that he'd be able to fly it because he had had an opportunity to fly another captured aircraft in England, which was interesting to me. Um, so he and Mandel are trying to shove this aircraft out, just the two of them. Um, unfortunately, the way the Germans had put them into the uh, canvas um, uh, hangar, uh, they kept getting it stuck on the edge, like the wing kept getting stuck. I can just imagine this of them early morning trying to shove it out. They eventually get the idea, okay, we just need to yank out the braces on this hangar and let it fall on the airplane. Um, so they're slowly getting it off the airplane, and a German mechanic rolls up. And Mandel tries to pull his usual spiel, oh yeah, help us push the airplane out, we've got an early morning flight. The guy didn't believe it for a second. Um, and so he, uh, they initially try to just club this guy or grab him. Um, he has a trench dagger or something to that effect, and he stabs Donaldson in the back. Um, Mandel knocks him out uh, as he's trying to yell help, and they haul out of there. Um, they're then hid for a while um, by, um, by a Belgian family, but Mandel in his report in Gorel's states he had hoped they had been able to do it because they were going to rake the airfield as they flew off. It would have been a great, great story if they had pulled it off, but they were going to rake the airfield as they flew off into the sunset or into the sunrise, I guess it would have been. Um, unfortunately for them, escape attempt number one, failure. Um, they are so close to the English lines, they can see the, balloon, the um, uh, balloons going up, they can hear the firing, they see the wire, uh, and unfortunately at that time, a German wiring party rolls up on them and basically steps on them. Um, they're captured, they're taken back, and I love this, uh, this quote here. So uh, they get them back to Condé, and the German guard there says, 
Americans were seditious and had a bad influence on the rest of the prisoners. Apparently after Donaldson and Mandel had escaped, um, five other prisoners had attempted escapes as well and had been recaptured. But again, Americans had this bad reputation of not behaving. I can't imagine why. Um, so they're sent to another prison, um, and fortunately, with the help of uh, a couple of their prisoners, they're able to, oh, and I should say, after a stint of 14 days in solitary confinement on bread and water, um, they are able to get a hacksaw blade and some pliers that they're able to rip the roof off of their prison um, and crawl out and jump down into the street. Um, he twists his ankle in the process, but Donaldson and two other aviators, Lieutenant Anderson and uh, Lieutenant uh, Tillinghead, Tillinghass, uh, the three of them start making north. They're going to get to Holland. That's their best bet, they figure. Um, so they move 150 miles uh, through northern France into Belgium. They consider another attempt at stealing another German airplane. Uh, they get to Brussels and they're being helped by Belgian civilians. Um, and the Belgian civilian says, oh, well, there's a a German airfield, you know, just outside of Brussels, take the trolley car out there and see what you can do. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, it's one of these gigantic Zeppelin hangers, and uh, Donaldson looks at it and says, it'd take 10 men to get that thing open. By that time, we're going to be prisoners again. So he's like, whatever, forget it. We're just going to keep going north. Um, so they keep being helped by the uh, Belgian civilians, uh, again, at much great peril to them. Um, Oh, by this time also, they had run into Mandel shortly. Mandel had been recaptured for the umpteenth time, uh, trying his human, usual German shtick, and got sent to Landshut Prison in Bavaria. Um, so he tried, I think, about five times Mandel did. He has an interesting story as well. Um, so they finally get to the Belgian-Dutch border, and I did not know about this until I started reading uh, Donaldson's account. Uh, they get to the wire of death. There was a large electric fence running across the entire Belgian-Dutch border, um, 2,000 volts. Um, so they finally, they sit there, they watch the sentry patterns, they recognize, well, there's an electric fence, so we need to cut that and not get electrocuted in the process. So they're able to get some, elect, uh, some, some insulated wire cutters, um, and so they, at one night, kind of crawl out that way. Oh, and by the way, Anderson, was also a Cornell grad, like, um, or a Cornell student like Donaldson. But while Donaldson was a civil engineer, uh, Anderson was an electrical engineer. So guess who got voted to clip the wires? <laughs> um, yeah, poor Anderson. So he goes and uh, fortunately does not get electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Um, although it starts shooting sparks everywhere and a German sentry hears. So they crawl under as fast as they can, yet hearing halt, halt, yelled behind them, a couple of rifle shots. Uh, fortunately, they are in Holland by the time anybody could get them. Um, so they, after 150 miles of walking over 28 days, uh, they get to Rotterdam and then are transported to The Hague. Uh, there, of course, is the usual diplomatic wrangling, well, you know, should they be, since we're neutral, should we even let you guys go back? Um, the American military attaché in The Hague goes, grabs them. They get new passports, and you can find his passport photo with him and his civilian guard in this previous image. Um, and let's see if I can go back. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so he, this is the same image, basically. They cut it out. Um, he looks very not AEF, but uh, they do get him back to England. He has lunch with King George V um, and eventually publishes this uh, entire crazy story in the July 1919 issue of Harper's Weekly. Highly, highly encourage you if you can read it. It's an interesting story. It's one of the best World War I stories I've heard in a long time. Um, and I should add, too, based off of the Gorels, um, everything from that first escape was corroborated by, um, by, um, sorry, uh, by Mandel. So, pilot number three. Sorry to keep going so fast. But Captain Elliot White Springs, Born in Lancaster, South Carolina, his father is Colonel Leroy Springs, one of the richest men in South Carolina. Um, he had created a spring cotton mills conglomerate uh, located in that northern portion of South Carolina, not far from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, young Elliot is sent to Culver Military Academy and then on to Princeton. Um, so 
I have to be honest. I'm not sure, and I, I told somebody else this this morning, I'm not sure I would have liked to have been around Ellie White Springs prior to World War I. He's kind of a jerk. Um, I can't say enough about this book here. Uh, if you're in the least bit interested, though, in getting a real perspective on him and just other pilots, uh, uh, the life of a pilot, uh, this Letters from Warbird, um, again, playing off of the book that he, with the help of somebody else's diary, published, um, really gives you a sense of who he was and kind of the transition he had throughout the war. Um, but he was very argumentative with his father and with his stepmother, um, but he just came off very entitled. You know, he would send his father, oh, I had a great time at the such and such hotel, please send more money to my account. Um, at one point, he wanted a Stutz Bearcat, and he said, well, I've already talked to the agent, I like it in this color, but if you wouldn't mind uh, sending him, you know, the funds from your bank account, uh, he'll get it to me. Worst case scenario, I'll take it in this other color. Um, you know, he, uh, and that Stutz Bearcat, believe it or not, also serves as the crash wagon for the Princeton Flying School. Um, so, he's heavily involved in the initial go of this, and this is an image of him there. So after he trains at Oxford, he's then posted to number 85 squadron, uh, where he falls under the command of Major Billy Bishop. Uh, again, kind of goes without stating what an impressive flyer he was. Uh, probably as speaking to Spring's capabilities, he is one of only three Americans Bishop selects to join 85 squadron. Um, he may have also selected Spring, because Spring was really good at making eggnog, apparently. And, uh, you know, so that could have helped, too. Uh, Spring, Spring definitely would have been that guy that you wouldn't mind going and partying with, but you might not want to, uh, to spend a lot of quality time with, at least in the, initially. So he trains in soft with dolphins, but begins his operational flying with 85 um, in SE 5 As. Um, so he scores his first four victories. Uh, between June 1st and June 25th, 1918. Um, after his first kill, I love this quote. Then a new chapter of my life began. I am now a changed man. I got sensations I never knew existed. You can tell he's kind of hooked on that adrenaline, on the you know the near death experience. You know, again, we've all probably felt that one time or another. You're going really fast. You do something stupid. You survive it, and then wow, what was that? Um, that's kind of how I imagine this occurred. Um, his quote about a dogfight is pretty straightforward out of the book, but um, this was him trying to explain what a dogfight was to his father. Because, again, you have to keep in mind, uh, this is, you know, this is one of the better letters when he's talking to his father. He's not just completely combative. And I should add, he had a reason to be frustrated with his father. Um, Leroy Springs was really trying to promote <clears throat> his son. Um, and would quite often do, against his son's wishes, sin portions of his letters out to the local newspapers, Elliot would figure out that that had occurred. And uh, at one point he said to his father, you should save some of these stories for my obituary. Um, yeah, I don't want you to run out of things to say. Um, and, you know, for the war memorial you're going to build me. Um, but, again, uh, just this, this was really well said. Um, you know, it really speaks again to the idea that he liked to go in quick, take a couple shots, and get out. Um, so on June 27th, uh, he and a couple others are making an attack on a German two-seater. The observer gets lucky and hits Spring's engine, uh, destroys the oil supply and pump, uh, and causes the engine to seize up and quit. No restarting. So he's gliding down. Uh, he does crash land in Allied lines, um, but he's injured by being thrown face first into the machine guns. This seems to be a common thread of bad ways to get injured flying in World War I, you're gonna, your face is going to meet those machine guns because they're right in front of you. Um, so he's evacuated to Duchess of Sutherland Hospital where he recuperated from those injuries uh, and then he gets noticed that he's being taken off of 85 Squadron and being posted as a flying commander to the 148th Aero Squadron. Now, I include the 148th Aero because they are, for all intents and purposes, a British unit made up of Americans. Um, they are nominally part of the U.S. Army Air Service because they fly British aircraft in support of British operations under British direction. Um, so, when he arrives at 148, he is greeted by Sopwith Campbells, Claire J. Power. Um, by this point in 1918, they're using them primarily for bomber escort missions, but also ground attack to support 
those advances that are finally being made, um, you know, post spring 1918. Um, so he talks a lot about the ground operations, how dangerous it was. They talk a lot about Archie and how that was more terrifying in some ways than meeting German fighters, because you can at least fight German fighters, you can't fight air, uh, any aircraft fire. Um, so his uh, description of the uh, Sopliff as being a tricky little biplane uh, was good. Um, they could do level uh, 90 level, but you couldn't fly level because you'd shake your teeth, oh, that got misspelled, teeth out in 40 seconds uh, by the clock. Uh, you had to climb or glide, uh, but they could fly upside down and turn inside a stairwell. So he definitely took advantage of the fact that that rotary engine gave them very, very sharp turning ability. Um, uh, and he said how deadly it was at low level if you could lure a Fokker down to low level. Um, because again, speed was not its advantage against the Fokker, that's for sure. Um, so with 148, he adds 12 more victories to his name. Um, some people claim he's the fifth um, highest scoring ace, but again, how do we rate that? Um, again, he's one of the highest scoring aces, definitely the highest scoring ace for South Carolina. Um, he is Distinguished Flight Cross recipient and a Distinguished Service Cross as well for his actions. So there are a couple more images of him. Um, you know, again, trying to be ever the playboy. Um, but I do love the gigantic smile he has on his face after nosing over his camel. Um, I think you've seen the footage, but I'm going to show it to you here. I'll skip ahead. Um, this is the first one, again. Critical Pass does a nice job of putting some of this up here, even with their watermark. So here we have Ellie White Springs with the 148. He mentions in his letters home that a filmmaker had come and that they decided to really put on a show for him There's and really show up. Uh, to the left of the dog. Okay. What's the name of the dog? There's Jesse Creech. Falker. <laughs> no, that's not Falker. <laughs> Falker's in another, he's in another part of this. And you can see the ground crew here, some of the lorries behind, and the, uh, the camels, and the uh, canvas shelters. Canvas hangers. Skip ahead a little bit. <coughs> I think this is Kenley as well, is it not? Yeah, there's Ken, there's Fox. Kenley and Fokker. Yeah. <laughs> and there's uh, there's Springs again in the middle of all the men there. Um, one thing that uh, somebody asked me was, well, how were they dressed? You know, were they keeping their AEF or were they more BEF? Or, uh, sorry, RFC, RAF? And, and the answer is kind of a mix. Um, you can see here it is. Uniform is obviously tailored, uh, no doubt on, uh, in London, but he does have the American Eagle up on his British style uh, <laughs> flat cap. Smoking right next to a gas, <laughs> probably a gasoline filled airplane. Really good choice. Um, so I'm going to see. Henry Clay is in the middle there. This thing about dress in the opening shot, you can see a couple of them were wearing open collars with shirts and ties. Right, and the Sam Brown belts, of course, come on. Springs didn't have the Sam Brown one. Right, yeah, some, some did, some didn't. Oh, for Pete's sake, come on. <laughs> Technology's great until it stops working. And who's the canine there? Yeah, let's see if I can That's get That's Larry out. Callahan at uh, Springs' left shoulder. Who's the guy that has the uh, two fingers? Oh, that was interesting too. Yeah, I like that how you kind of snuck that in. That was a, an obscene gesture, I believe. Oh yes, <laughs> to the to the British. Yes. The British. So uh, this is actually more interesting, I think, in some ways beyond getting to see the actual pilots, because this shows a little bit of the operations the 148 was doing with their camels. Um, again, the the white triangle was their symbol, um, so you can pick them out. Uh, despite everything else suggesting their RAF with uh, the round dolls and everything else to that effect. Well, that's also British uh, use of abstract emblems. A, a dumbbell was their sister squadron's emblem, the 17th. Right. And uh, Theo Tillinghast came, had been shot down with them. Okay. Very good. That earlier shot, you can see on the film of the time, tend to, tend to reverse the, uh, the rings and the blues. Mm hmm that type just slipped my mind, but it has some, has some weird registrations. Right. And you can see the bomb racks, again, um, some aircraft 
had them, some didn't for that ground attack role with the, uh, the Cooper bombs. Depended um, on the job. Depended on the job, exactly right. Um, this one, I, they, they show a little bit of DH9, DH9, Airco, DH9. Um, that's from 206 Squadron or 104. Cool. Look at the grounds. Um, yeah. Formation. So that's what they asked. For escort. Um, Donaldson does a really nice job of explaining the, the process of bomber uh, protection and talking about how you know if the bombers were at ten thousand, you had every two thousand feet another flight of three that would be behind or around uh, to swoop down on anything attacking them. Um, so yeah, this is this is definitely them uh, barnstorming. And uh, spring, I should say, after the war even, was known to do this in South Carolina, much to some people's chagrin of him buzzing houses and all sorts of other things. And here we go. Here's his, uh, here's his airplane that they took the photo of him smiling like a, the Cheshire cat in front of. Well, hey, any um, landing you walk away from. That's right. Well, I think all the ground the ground crew seem okay with it, but uh, yeah, I think he needed a new propeller when all is said and done. This is one thing that Wing Up Wings noticed, um, and I have their model of Springs aircraft here, but the subdued or the attempts to kind of subdue the uh, the light on the rondelles on top. Notice um, also a cut out center section to improve the pilot's upward visibility. Exactly. Right. Achilles heel of a camel. Right. See the ground handling equipment there as well that they're going to put underneath the uh, the tail to make it a little bit easier to move around. And it's just repurposed uh, repurposed uh, main main tires. So anyway, um, you know when you when you have the ability to show off some of the actual footage from that era, it's uh, always a good thing. All right, come on, behave. I want to go back to the full screen. All right. Oh, looks like I might have an issue. Let's see. All right, we're just going to go with it. All right, so my last pilot, Bonham Bossick. Um, he was from Jasper County, South Carolina, the low country. Um, his father was the manager of a club that still exists to this day. It's a 50,000-acre quail hunting club um, in Ridgeland, South Carolina. Um, so he was definitely with names. Um, he attended Princeton University with Elliott White Springs and learned to fly um, at the Princeton Air School alongside it. Um, he trained at Oxford and then was posted to number 43 squadron. And where the other three had very impressive service careers, Bostic not so much. Um, he shows up and in a very short span of time crashes. The cause of the crash is so convoluted and I can't even tell you which version seems the least bit reasonable because he offers about three different versions of newspaper articles that he sent letters in. Um, and also his obituary, and I'll get to that. So uh, what I can say is he did crash. Um, he, in his remembrance of it, he, and he wasn't remembering this, by the way, um, because he was completely concussed. Uh, he probably was in a coma, to be honest. Um, but it, he said it took 25 minutes with hacksaws and chisels to extract him from the rack, wreck. And then the litany of injuries here. Broken left jaw, hole in left cheek, left eyeball bruised, right cheek ripped open, artery cut in right cheek, hole in right foot, knee laid open, wound to the right thigh, calf torn, and that severe concussion and or coma because uh, Elliot White Springs talks about running into him in London at the hospital and saying he was just starting to come out of that concussion. Okay. Um, so he, it's interesting to see that he was actually, what the evacuation process was for an RF, RAF pilot or RFC pilot in this era. So he was first evacuated to Rouen where he was stabilized and then transported to the Royal Flying Corps Central Hospital in London. Um, he did get, does get eventually released um, after they work on him. I think he probably benefits from some of the plastic surgery efforts that were being um, Tried, although he still says his beauty was uh, was damaged, something to that effect, uh, by this, and you know, with his scars. Uh, but Spring relates that he uh, he was a plucky young 19-year-old, 
Um, so again, going back to that, he says he was shot down. He says that he uh, that just crashed. The long and short, it sounds like it was a landing accident or a takeoff accident that he didn't remember what happened, uh, or he was trying to make a really good story. Um, so what happened to him after the war? So Donaldson continues with the Infant Army Air Service um, for a short time and then participates in the 1919 Great Transcontinental Air Race. Um, so he is one of the names listed on the McKay Trophy for 1919. He came in third, and fittingly, he was flying an SE 5A. Uh, most of the other pilots were flying two seaters or bigger aircraft. He decided, I'm going to do it in a solo seat aircraft, which is pretty impressive for the era. Um, at one point, he even crashes it uh, or makes a hard landing and has to rebuild overnight uh, the undercarriage so that he can take off and get to San Francisco. Um, so in the 1920s, he leaves the Army and founds the Newark uh, Air School and Newark Air Service at the Newark uh, Municipal Airport. Also in 24, he finally gets the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, and just an interesting photo from Library of Congress. Uh, this is his father, T.Q. Donaldson, still a Brigadier General, eventually becomes a Major General, his mother and his wife, uh, and a civilian at that point, Pershing, um, or at least in civilian clothing. Um, and again, this one resonates or is very, very similar. The citation is very similar to that that he earned with the Distinguished Flying Cross from Great Britain. Unfortunately, like many early aviators, um, and this is true for all my South Carolina aviators, you run into those who are kept pushing the envelope, kept pushing the envelope, and uh, he dies on September 7th, 1930, um, at the Legion Air Meet when he borrows a uh, plane from Opal Kuntz, uh, her travel air, and it sounds like he spins it and can't get it out of the spin and goes crashing in uh, and is killed. Um, the obituary here, I kicked the better part of it. The other part said, you know, it's too bad that men like him who are so talented go and kill themselves in airplanes. But um, <laughs> that, was one, that was one remembrance of him because they just felt like it was such a waste. But it did say that he was one of the brightest young men that ever lived in Greenville. His war record was fitting testimonial to his quick perception, keenness, and courage. He was a zestful, enthusiastic young man who loved life and determined to get the most out of it. Uh, to his way of thinking. Um, I think that's about as good as you can be, can be said about anybody, to be honest. Um, and he's buried in Atlanta, Georgia. So again, even ever, ever one that I can't place in one place, he's buried in Atlanta. So, Elliot White Springs, <coughs> after the war, he is an interesting person. Um, still, uh, one thing I can say about him, the war changed him. He matured, he aged significantly if you look between the images from him at Princeton to the end of the war. Um, he loses several good friends during the war. Um, and one, uh, one thing he states at the end of the war is he didn't expect to survive. Um, he says, you know, I fully expect that I'd be dead by this point, and now that the war's ended, I'm not quite sure that I had considered what I'd do if I survived. Um, so in the Roaring Twenties, he's heavily involved in New York, um, gets in trouble with his father for marrying a Yankee. Um, he's writing for couriers, he's writing his other books, uh, he wrote Warbirds based off of his letters and those of his friend John Greider, uh, who was killed. Um, unfortunately, in the second go of publishing it, uh, the Greider family sues him uh, for copyright and call him a thief or uh, for the work. And uh, anyway, he settles with them, and it sounds like he gave them about half of the profits he made on the book. Um, so when his father died in the er early 30s, he took over Springs Mill, um, and despite the Great Depression makes it a very successful textile company, um, he actually keeps making fabric through the Depression, and World War II saves his shirt, uh, literally, because the Army is trying to buy up every bit of cotton it can with World War II. Um, he also goes back to the Army Air Corps as a colonel and runs the base in Charlotte, North Carolina for a time until he has a nervous breakdown due to post-traumatic stress from 1918. Um, but the other thing he's known for in South Carolina is his risque ads. Uh, he didn't invent 
the idea that sex sells, but he definitely took full advantage of it. Um, this is one of the more uh, PC ones that uh, was published. There are a lot of uh, double entendres being used uh, involving sheets, so you can kind of put one or two together on that. Um, and he uses those very successfully to promote his uh, spring-made fabrics uh, until his death in uh, 1959, the age of 63, from cancer. Uh, Bostic. Gosh, Bostic. Um, so again, he comes back to the U.S. and uh, has about five or six different careers. The ones I was able to pin down were peanut processing, a flight instructor in the 1930s, and ultimately an advertising executive. I think the advertising helps with some of his stories. Um, so he dies in 1968, and uh, again, his obituary goes further and says, oh, he was, his, his plane crashed because a big Bertha shell the shock wave knocked it out of the sky. So, you know, it's a good story. But, you know, as, as any of us know, good stories get bigger with time. So I guess the Big Bertha was the final uh, act in that. Um, he's buried in Columbia, South Carolina at Trinity Episcopal Church, um, right across from the State House. So, is there a lasting legacy? There are two. One is Donaldson Center, formerly known as uh, Donaldson Air Force Base in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, this is actually where Lockheed Martin is currently trying to win their contract to make the next uh, trainer for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, they also do work on P-3 Orions and other things there. Um, my father remembers when it was still an active Army Air Force base. It helped with the Berlin Airlift and was Transport Command. Uh, during World War II, it was just Greenville Army Air Base, and that was a training field for B-25 pilots and some B-24 pilots. Then, Shaw Air Force Base. So in 1941, when they're establishing a flying uh, base at Sumter, South Carolina, uh, his classmates uh, from Sumter High School get together and push the Air Force to name it after Irvin Shaw. Um, and so Shaw Air Force Base to this day is a fighter base, and we fly F-16s out of uh, Shaw to this day. Um, it's very fitting. Uh, everything I can point to says that our Urban Shaw was the first South Carolinian killed in combat during World War I. Um, so that pretty much concludes my talk, but I definitely want to thank first Mike O'Neill. He's not here, but Mike O'Neill got me started on this crazy project of South Carolina aviators because I made some half remark of, oh, you know, I'm interested in South Carolina aviators. He said, oh, are you? I've got a full list. Here, have at it. Um, so thanks, Mike, for getting me down this uh, crazy path. Uh, to Carl Barbaro for pushing me to do things like this and to keep going with my efforts. Um, a big part of this and also got me involved with the league. Uh, Russell Smith was very kind to let me use his artwork. So again, a thanks to him and also for his efforts to try and to find out more about Urban Shaw as well. Um, special collections at Furman University were extremely helpful with those letters and also the story from Harper's Weekly. Uh, Sandy Way uh, is uh, a man of, of much repute in Sumter. Uh, he is the archivist for the Sumter Item, which is the local newspaper, and spent a good part of a day with me talking about Urban Shaw, showing me family photos and such. Uh, and of course, to all of you, the League and the Aerodrome, uh, and some of the other sources I used. Thank you very much. <laughs>